to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said in Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead and is alive forevermore. As we think today about more about Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we think about Jesus in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation scares a lot of people because it contains some language that is a little unusual compared to the rest of the New Testament. But friend, I assure you, the images of Jesus in the book of Revelation offer comfort and encouragement and hope to every child of God. And so we encourage you to get out your Bible and be turning to Revelation as we think about learning more about Jesus. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. They'd love to sit down and study the Bible with you. If you've got a question, you've got a concern, visit the Lord's Church in your area and they'd love to help you. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of our series of lessons on more about Jesus, you can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and from there you can order our free media that's available, whether it be video or audio. We have transcripts, we have study questions, have a whole host of Bible study material that can be very beneficial for you, and it's all free of charge. You can call us, you can write to us, we'd be glad to help you in any way. And friend, if you're concerned with things about salvation, maybe you've got questions about how to be saved or about the Lord's church, we'd love to help you in answering those from the Word of God. We have our desire out of pure motives, sincere motives, is to help men and women to better know the will of God and ultimately to go to heaven. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about other hidden agendas. We just simply want men and women to go to heaven. If you've got anything we could help you with, please let us know. As we think today about Jesus in the book of Revelation, just to kind of set some things before us concerning the book of Revelation, let's realize that Revelation is written primarily to encourage and comfort suffering Christians. Revelation 6 verse 9, there are some who have been martyred, who have died for the cause of Christ at the hands of an evil Roman government, and the souls of those under the altar are crying out. Oh Lord, how long? And the answer is, you're in a redeemed place. You're in the best place you could ever be. Let God work things out on His time frame, and Christians will be victorious. And so, one of the key words in the book of Revelation is all about victory and overcoming, and it offers comfort and hope to suffering Christians. Imagine this. It's written to Christians in Asia Minor. And imagine you're sitting around the table, and you don't know but that the next knock on the door might be the Roman government coming to get you, coming to get your parents. It might be some kind of notification that somebody in your family or congregation has just been imprisoned for living for Christ. It looks like the Roman government's going to be victorious. It looks like the Caesars are going to rule and God's church is going to be stomped out. And your faith maybe is beginning to, you're beginning to have questions. And God says, it's all going to be okay. I'm going to take care of Rome. You're going to be victorious. Be faithful unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10. Now, as we think about more about Jesus, with that background in mind, what is it in the book of Revelation that gives us comfort and hope concerning the nature of Christ? Well, in Revelation chapter 1, we vividly see the majesty and the power of Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate. In Revelation chapter 1, when I think about images of Jesus that offer comfort, I can't help but turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5. The Scripture says of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Here comes this message of victory, and who's it from? It's from the most victorious one, 
Jesus Christ, firstborn from the dead. What's that say? Death didn't conquer Christ. Ruler over the kings of the earth. It looks like Domitian or it looks like Nero's ruling. No, this is from the real ruler of the kings of the earth, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who made the ultimate sacrifice and the one who's washed us from our sins in His own blood. And so the victorious Christ sends this powerful letter and expresses His majesty and His power over death over the world rulers and over sin. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5. Now, as I look to the book of Revelation, and as I think about Jesus in images of victory, you can't help but see that one in Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Look at these images. The scripture says, John said, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, look at this, one like the Son of Man. What do you mean like the Son of Man? Well, not quite like. Clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like white like wool, and as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. His voice says the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of Hades and of death. You talk about images of power and majesty. Here's Jesus and how's He dressed? White robe down to His feet. His hair white, shining with purity and, and righteousness. Eyes like that of a, a fire. Sword coming out of His mouth. Has the keys of Hades and death. The very things that these Christians are suffering from and facing. Jesus says, I'm in control of those. He has the churches within His hand. We'll learn what those are in Revelation chapter 2. He's in control of the world governments, the very things they fear. He's already conquered death. He said, I was dead, and I'm I was dead, I'm alive, and I'll be alive forevermore. There's nothing for these Christians to fear as they look to Jesus. He offers every hope that you can ever imagine for them. And so we see His control and His power and His majesty in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 2, as we think about Jesus in the book of Revelation, we see Him as the head of His church. Now there are seven congregations in chapters 2 and 3 that Jesus will write to. Of those seven, five have got some problems they've got to work out. Two, Jesus doesn't give any recommendation to, or rather offers encouragement, but five of those need to correct some things. But Jesus, to every one of those, He addresses them. He says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. There will be changes that need to be made. Jesus will make compliments along the way, and in every one of them, He offers hope as the head of the church. Listen to these words. For example, in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says in verse number 10, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, 17, To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, To him who overcomes, Jesus said, I will grant to sit with me on my Father's throne. As head of the church, Jesus is in control. Now, it looks like there's another head at this time. It looks like the dominant world power is going to be the ruling Roman government. And it looks like they're going to stomp out Christianity. But Jesus, as the head of the church, arises. He says, you worry about what's going on here. I'm going to take care of the rest. You trust me. Be faithful, and I'll give you the joy of one day overcoming. You know, we've talked a little bit about the introductory ideas in Revelation. The key word in Revelation is that word overcome. It is the Greek word nikao. The idea is to be victorious. And Christians, if they remain faithful to God, will be victorious. Now, how is this practical to us today? Revelation is a book written to encourage first century Christians that they will not be snuffed out, that Rome will not win, that Christ will be victorious. What do these images remind us of? Friend, in a world where sin still exists, in a world where there are still evil governments 
that are opposed to God and righteousness and Christ and Christianity. The comfort and consolation we have is by knowing the same Christ who is seen as so powerful and so majestic in chapter 1. The same Christ who was the head of the church then is still the head of the church today. And it's His will that will ultimately be the one that's important. Jesus still, God still rules in the kingdoms of men. Daniel chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. And as Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Christ. He'll reign forever and ever. He's the one in His kingdom that is really the important kingdom in this world. Then we look in Revelation chapter 5 and we see a, a rather vivid image of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Jesus is here seen as a lamb that is slain. Let me kind of set the, the tone and the tenor of chapter 5. John receives this scroll, but he can't open the scroll and he begins to weep bitterly because no one can open the scroll. And, and then there's hope given. Re Revelation chapter 2, chapter 5, verse number 8. The Bible says that the Lamb took the scroll. The four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of its incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain, you have redeemed us to God by your blood, and of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. You know, when you think about the images here of Christ, He appears as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He takes the scroll. The scroll contains the message of, of God's wrath and His message of victory for Christians. And John holds that message in his hand, but he can't open it. And there's great sorrow in not opening it. Enter the Lamb who was slain for the foundation of the world. He takes that scroll. He opens it. He brings forth God's plan. That plan is that He would die for all men. That plan is that He would make an ultimate sacrifice as the, the, the Lamb without spot or blemish. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 through 20. And because He did that, His kingdom was established. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Then He said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. His church was established. And friend, listen very carefully. It is that church that is the dominant kingdom then, was the dominant kingdom then, and is the dominant kingdom today. What is the one kingdom that will outlast, outlive, and con conquer all other kingdoms? The one that Jesus established. Revelation 11 verse 15 clearly teaches that idea. And so Jesus here opens the scroll. He fulfills God's will. God's wrath is going to be unleashed on the evil, ungodly government, and Christians are going to be victorious. You know, when we face suffering, listen carefully, here's the application. When I face suffering, uh, when we face persecution, when for preaching the gospel people look down on the church and look down on God's people, what's the message of hope and comfort? The Lamb that was slain, He's still in control today. His kingdom is still the most important kingdom. God is still ruling in the kingdoms of men, and if I remain faithful to Him, I'll let God work out the rest, and I'll assure you, God will do so in His own time and in His own way. Think about it this way. Rome was the ruling world then, world power. They were reaping great havoc on Christians. Some were dying. Some were being put in prison. Revelation 2.10, uh, Revelation 6 verse 9. Uh, they were being persecuted greatly. They were being, some were trying to force them to worship the emperor. They were not doing that. What happened to Christians then? God took care of them. God made sure that their rights were, their wrongs were righted, and God took vengeance in His own time and way. But here's the more important question. What happened to Rome? Where is Rome at today? Rome is little more as a world power than a small, small blip on the radar. They were brought down to their knees by Almighty God. The nations that rise up against God and His kingdom today will face that same judgment ultimately, and Christians will indeed always be victorious. Now, how else do I see Jesus in the book of Revelation? Jesus is seen as the avenger of His saints. Notice again Revelation chapter 6. We mentioned this earlier, but in Revelation chapter 6, there's an interesting scene that starts in about verse number 9. The Bible records, 
when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our bloods on those who dwell on the earth? Revenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both their number of the fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. And so here you've got, you've got death. You've got persecution. You've got tormenting. You've got people who've died for the cause of Christ, and, and they've got a huge question. How long, God, are you going to let this go on until you right the wrongs? We know. The Bible said, you said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. When are you going to do that? And God says, I want you to come over here and rest a little while. Here's these white robes. You've been given a, a, a victorious place already. Take it easy, rest for a moment. There's still some things that have got to be worked out. But ultimately, Jesus says, I'll take care of those in my own time and in my own way. And friend, you can be assured, as you read the book of Revelation, as you look at the things that transpired throughout history, God has always been the avenger of His people. You know, sometimes we might think to ourselves, well, I need to right this wrong. I need to take care of this. As it relates to Christians being persecuted, as it relates to those speaking evil against God's Word and His kingdom and His church, sure, we ought to stand up for truth. But I'm going to ultimately let God right those wrongs. God will take care of His own people. Those who died in the first century, they were not forgotten. They were given a great place of honor, and they were taken into that ultimate rest. And friend, those who suffer for the cause of Christ today, and yes, we will suffer, those who suffer for the cause of Christ can be assured God knows their suffering. God knows their tears. God cares greatly, and God ultimately will take care of those things, if not now. In eternity, all the wrongs will indeed be righted by Almighty God. Now, as you look further into the book of Revelation, there's an interesting scene that unfolds in Revelation chapter 7. Here we see Jesus ultimately as the great shepherd of His people who is going to be leading them toward that heavenly rest. Look at Revelation chapter 7. And I want you to notice beginning about verse number 9. After these things John said, I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, serve Him day and night in His temple, and He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters." Listen to this beautiful language. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here's a, a scene of victory. How are these Christians going to be victorious? These who come, the people who are standing around the throne of God. The question is asked, who are they? They've come out of this great tribulation. They're the ones who followed the Lamb wheresoever He went. There'll be joy. There'll be happiness. God will wipe away every tear. No more hunger. Uh, no more of the sorrow, the sun won't beat down on them anymore is the idea. All the difficulties and troubles and challenges they face, if they follow the great shepherd, and if they continue, if we continue to follow him, friend, I can assure you, Jesus will lead us to heaven itself. Are there times where we face difficulty? There's no doubt there is. Are there times where perse persecution is going to rise? You can bet there's going to be. Might it increase in the day and age in which we live? It very well may. But if we follow the great shepherd, if we follow Jesus, ultimately, 
He'll lead us to that wonderful place that we know of as heaven itself where there will be none of the sorrows that we face today. Now, I kind of want to jump forward just a little bit to show you another picture that I think is so important about Jesus in the book of Revelation. We've got to see Jesus in the book of Revelation as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Look in Revelation chapter 11, verse number 15. This is very likely one of the key verses in Revelation. The Bible says in verse 15, Then the seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Again, we're talking about during the time of evil persecution. It looks like Rome's going to be the conquering kingdom, and Christ says, God says, no, the world kingdom has become the kingdom of our Christ and of his Lord. This is the one that's important today. Now, just for a moment, think about Revelation chapter 17. Another great scene of victory in which Christ is presented as the ultimate king. Revelation chapter 17, you'll notice verse number 14. The Bible says, representing these worldly kingdoms, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Why? He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. What do we know about Jesus in the book of Revelation? Of all the kings that have ever lived, and of all the lords that have ever existed, Jesus is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. What's that mean? He's more powerful. He's more important. He's more royalty than they ever imagined. And His power, His deity, and His divinity have control over all world kingdoms then and today. And so as we do have to face things, as we do sometimes wonder, God, why are you letting these, happen, these things happen? Why is it that our evil world and sometimes evil governments are, are, are allowing these things to occur? For just a moment, I need to pause and I need to realize God's still on the throne. The King of all kings and Lord of all lords is still in control. He conquered then, He'll conquer today. We'll be victorious if we continue to trust in the Almighty and don't lose hope. Now there's another powerful image that I want you to see about Jesus and it's found in Revelation chapter 12. This is probably one of the more practical as we think about the temptation and the sin and the suffering that we face. Look at the picture of Jesus in Revelation 12:11 as the one who's able to help us defeat Satan. Verse number 11 says, And they overcame him, that is Satan, Revelation 12, 9, the dragon who is Satan, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. You know, one of the more powerful images we see, and this is what it really all comes down to, Satan, the dragon, he's the one who's behind all of this. And friend, he's the one behind it today. You know, I can be concerned about world governments. I can be concerned about temptation and persecution, but there's one person I need to be more concerned about. I want to cut to the chase and realize who's the real evil architect, and it's Satan. Can I overcome Satan, the one, the mastermind behind all of this? Absolutely. How? Same way Christ helped Christians to overcome it. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. How can you overcome Satan today? The only way to overcome the stranglehold of sin and Satan and, and spiritual death is by the blood of the Lamb. Friend, the good news is Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. And because of that, Christians are washed in His blood. Revelation 1, verse number 5, and we're cleansed. And so you can overcome by the blood of the Lamb, which is the sacrifice of Jesus. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony we have recorded today and know as the New Testament or the Bible. How do you overcome Satan today? By the word of God. Now, again, we see a great illustration of this. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted, how did he overcome Satan? It is written, it is written, it is written. Not only do I have access to the blood of the Lamb, I have access to the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, which can help me to defeat Satan. But then there's a third thing Jesus helps me to do, and that is to live a life of sacrifice. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. There's the sacrifice of Jesus. The Word of God, Scripture, 
and they did not love their lives unto the death. Self-sacrifice. How do you overcome Satan? By not focusing on self. Not letting the things of this world, not taking those personally per se, but rather realize I'm suffering because I'm a servant of Christ and how wonderful that is if we can suffer as servants of the Lord. If I have to suffer for Christ, that's a joy. For all that He did for me, that's a joy that I would have to suffer and give up for Him. And so wonderful things are seen in the book of Revelation, but one of the most wonderful is found in Revelation chapter 21. As you think about Christ and all the things that He does for us, ultimately we see that we can have a home with God in heaven. Listen to Revelation 21, this picture of God in Christ in verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God was with, is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You know, this book so wonderfully reveals the, the, the victory that Christians are ultimately going to have over any type of evil, whether it be Satan, whether it be sin, whether it be persecution or an evil government, the good news is, if I'm faithful unto death, I can have the crown of life. If I remain true to God, there awaits a heavenly rest for each one of us, Hebrews 4 verse 9. And so, as we think about Jesus in the book of Revelation, one of the things we must seriously consider is, is that lamb who was slain? Have we taken, have we taken part? Have we uh, made use of? Have we really been obedient to His gospel? Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Jesus said it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven, Matthew 7, 21. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What does Jesus want? He wants us to believe in Him as the Savior, John 8, 24. He wants us to submit to Him and change our lives, Acts 3 verse 19, to with our mouth acknowledge Him as the Christ, Acts 8 verse 36 and 37, and Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. May Jesus help us in every way to strive to overcome sin and be victorious on that great day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. With his bride, this is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.